going to do in this life of trust now? You're going to praise God as much as you did or more? I see he's getting you ready for assignments. So all the time I'm talking, he's going to see if he can trust you with things. All of you, everyone, all of you, everyone here, you see, he's trying to see if he can get your heart to trust him so that he can take care of th things over the world. Everyone, see, he's trying to work with you. See, anything that God leads to do has to do with about all that's there. But people don't know. They just think it's a story. They just think it's a happen. So, no, it isn't. See, there are many things. If you will get this in your heart, he's trying to work with you about situations, conditions, marvelous things in your life to come around you where you'll be in various parts of the world. Be faithful. Be true. See, this is where romance, thrills, and adventure is. In little places, it seems like it isn't anything. See, I have wonderful times in just little places. I don't have to be in Paris or in Rome or London or New York or Los Angeles to have a great time with the Hawaiian Islands. I'll just be in a little spot with one man. Praise God. Hallelujah. God blessing me as if I'm in a great place and heaven's all around. Yeah. Boy, I had a great time. Yes. The other day, I had such a great time in on our condominium that Jesus miraculously provided. I had a great time. Wonderful. Brother Him, how could it be? Well, I was trusting. I was still marching. I marched right through the lobby, right outside, got just outside the door, and the Holy Spirit said, the security guard needs some food. He's hungry. I ran back in there. He was busy with this one and that one calling. I don't know what all. And I said, I said, oh, Roland, would it be all right if I get you some food? Uh, he said, oh, yes, Reverend. And he started to reach for his wallet. I said, oh, no, 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 no. I mean, let me get it. Lord, help me. God's people's provided a few pennies for me. And I, I want to get you some food. Well, of course, that's, I just said, do you want it? And he said, oh, yes. And I was on my way. Well, I hurried across to the Sweden house across from Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church where I've been now for some time off and on hearing this great preacher one of the greatest scholars on the earth today probably one of the greatest scholars I have ever heard in my life I heard him debate an evolutionist the other day for three hours in Pinecrest School when we got on the campus Miss Helen me and the beautiful men said evolution evolution boy they were all for evolution this evolutionist had convinced Ninety some percent of the students, and so they're all evolutionists. Just about all university students now are evolutionists. <clears throat> the professors don't teach them about the miraculous creation, they teach them about the theory of Darwinism. Well, he had them convinced. That's when the evolutionists came in, the students cheered him. He said the uh, next Sunday morning when he entered the pulpit, he said it was quite obvious who the, uh, that all the students were convinced of this theory of evolution, which we saw right away. That was true. <clears throat> so I went into the Sweden house and I ate my little lunch. And I got my our security guard, I got him two breasts, pieces of white meat, two pieces, and a leg, and a nice slice of raisin bread. And then another little cupcake was real nice too. Not overly sweet. Then another something. Then I had in the carryout, I had a nice little helping of green garden peas. And then I had another little trough there to fill up. So I thought, I'll give him my choice. That's green beans. So I started reaching clear across to get the green beans. And just as I started to go across, he said, he said, don't get the green beans. Well, I don't know, know about his eating habits and a strange man that just went down around some of these little streets. <clears throat> so there was the Harvard Beach right on the side. So I just went right into the Harvard Beach and just filled it up. Not filled it full, but pretty good helper. Hoping and trusting that he liked Harvard Beach. <laughs> That's the way the Lord led me for Harvard Beach, not green beans. So here I came back. Oh, I was in there and I brought it into the little kitchen right off from the office there where, you, where they stay night and day. 
And uh, I put it in there. And he said, Reverend Helm, how did you know I was hungry? He said, you know, I, I knew he lived 17 miles away and he had to be at work at 8 o'clock in the morning. And he said, all I had this morning was one cup of coffee. And he said, that was at 1 and 45 in the afternoon. He said, you know, I've been hungry. He said, how did you know it? Well, I said, Laurel, I don't know anything myself. I didn't tell him I was on a life of trust, but I am. So when I went out, Jesus said, he's hungry. So I went back and asked him for permission to get a little. And he was so delighted that God would have me to get him some food. He said, you know, I thought maybe when I'd get off at 4 o'clock and go a little 17 miles, I could get a little something to eat. But somebody was telling me later, I didn't know it. He said, about all he eats is wieners. He doesn't have any much to go on. He has to take his money and give it to five children. His wife, part of them. So he don't have very much to live on. I didn't realize that until later. But uh, I thought, I'll run upstairs and get him some cold orange juice. We buy the fresh orange juice with the gallon. And we fed this precious fella some pineapple coconut juice, and you should have seen it. Oh, he had such a time with coconut butter. You never had anything like it in your life. Oh, you liked it so much, you took it back to West Virginia. Yeah, it was something. It's something to get a taste of that. <clears throat> So I thought I'd get a glass. I'd take our security guards uh, in the evening or night. I'd try to take them a glass of orange juice, cold orange juice. So this wasn't uncommon. He'd been used to that. So I ran upstairs, five stories. I came down, and I brought him in. But this time, he changed the food and put it over this little other little office where he could look in and see everybody coming and going. He said, I just changed on you here while you're going. I wanted to get here so I could see everything and, and eat because he's hungry. I, did you know he was hungry? The Lord told me. The Lord revealed it to me. And I brought the orange juice in, and he said, Reverend Hell, how did you know I was hungry for Harvard Beats? He said, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, some of the folks here gave me a little can of beets, and I see them on the shelf, but he lives by himself, and you've got to know how to prepare them. And he said, I'll go by, and I'll look at him. I said, oh, I'm so hungry for beets. But he says, someday, maybe. Someday, maybe I can get worked out so I can have some Harvard beets. He said, I'd look day after day and week after week. Those beets, he said, how did you know? I said, oh, I was so thankful for beets. I'm talking about trusting now. We went from marriage to meals. <laughs> marriage to meals. We're talking about trusting. Trusting. I had to trust. Some people get offended. Yeah, if you want to get them anything, they're offended. Well, one of, one of my first pastor, 40 years ago, one of the ladies, she was so scared. She said, Brother Hell, Brother Hell, would you, would you be offended if I wanted to give you a dozen eggs? She was so scared because she told me the pastor before me said, no, I've got money. I can get them for myself. Well, I can get eggs. She said, I was afraid. I was a little afraid you might. Oh, I said, Sister Vance, I'd praise God for every one. Well, I'd, have praised, I'd praised him for all of them if it's half rotten. Six of them. I'd praised him if, 12, if 11 of them were rotten. And I'd praised him just the same if all 12 were rotten. It wasn't the eggs. It was she wanted to give. Oh, of course we needed the eggs. We only had $700 to live. This little daughter here was only, she was just a few years old when we were there. In fact, she wasn't two years old when we got there. This little precious doll was up here, the mother of our grandchildren. Oh, what? Then only had $700 to live on, and that was to commute back and forth from Red Key to Ted University, Upland. Had to drive back and forth every day. $700 to eat and pay and buy, and <laughs> that's all year. Oh, we were happy. Oh, yes. Indeed. How Jesus takes care and makes the way. Why? But I had, to, I had to be sure that in the life of trust I don't offend anyone. That I'm an order. Don't talk too much. Don't talk too little. Just say exactly every word because a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. Talking about trusting. He said, oh, I, I've been so hungry for beets, and I've wanted beets. He said, he just marveled. Well, we went upstairs, and my wife and I came down a couple hours, and just we got down, he said, oh, Reverend Helm, I was just ready to call you up there and tell you how thankful I am. 
He said, I just had to tell you something. My wife was with me. Why, well, I said, Rolla, I'm so glad. See, it wasn't, it wasn't anything for me to get that food. It wasn't. Why? Why, that wasn't anything much. It was just, a, just something that Jesus told me to do. He said, I just want to tell you something. Why, well, I said, I'm glad. He said, I, I have friends in the priesthood. In fact, he helped the priest in the, in the masses years ago. He did that up until his twin sister and four, three or four children was killed at one time. He became bitter. That was years ago. But then soon as this awful bitterness when she was killed, he said, you walk into mortuary and there's four or five caskets there. And of course he is weak, just like I am and you are. And he said, it took a while, but God gave him a marvelous deliverance of that. But he said, I have, I know priests and I know rabbis and ministers. He said, I've been with people. Of course, he's been with them many times. He said, I've been with them and everyone has always made me feel guilty. But he said, I wanted to tell you that when I'm with you, you make me feel good. Oh, I said, Rollin. Then my wife told him something. She told him, she said, my husband loves everyone, tries to help everybody if he can. Trusting Jesus. A few days, I bring you some more food. Oh, when I find out somebody's hungry, look out. <laughs> yeah, left an envelope with so many dollars down there so he could find it. Because I found out he only had a dollar left. Well, when you find somebody that's in, in need, you just give them what you have or what you can spare or give them whatever Jesus wants you to. So I brought him in some more food. <laughs> brought him in some more. He said to me, that was a few days later, he said, I want to tell you something. I'm sure glad I met you. You're all right. <laughs> Melody Joy heard him tell me. I said, well, listen, it's by God's grace that I can make it out of nothing. I didn't tell him, but the Lord knew I, my heart was crying like that. We aren't anything. Trusting Trusting Jesus. The Lord came and the marriage of Robert and Barbara was very precious, April the 2nd. After their marriage, I got to preaching up and down the aisles. Oh, God helped me to cry out to the church and tell them we're a long way short of where God wants us. And while I was under that anointing, a man that was going to die before long. In fact, we were privileged to help pray him from death in 1952 on March the 13th. <clears throat> and this, you see, was back in 73. He told me in the hospital just a few days after that, Robert and Barbara, after your marriage, and we were preaching out to all the people there. He said, while you were preaching, he said, God told me to get up and say, but you're not hearing him. You people are not hearing this man. You're not hearing him. But he said, I couldn't get it done. He said, I, he prayed with me for 20, 21 years. And we would pray one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. He's prayed with me half the night and sometimes all night. He's been with me in many places for oh, two decades. He said to me in that hospital room, he said, I want to tell you something. He said, you used to say years ago, 10 or 15 years ago, are you hearing? I said, well, I'm hearing. I'm hearing, he said. He said, I hear you say, are you hearing me? 15 years ago, 10 years ago. Of course, that goes back to 20. Because he'd been with me for 21 years then and over. Because we found him in 1950 because of Mary. Wolf, it's over here to my left. He said, you know, I found out after I was with you 20 years, I hadn't been hearing very well. Told me that just before he's dead. He said, I've just found out that I haven't been hearing you. He said, I thought I heard you all the time. I was privileged to pray for him in 1953 for him to receive the gift of visions. I've seen him receive visions of Jesus Christ because God administered the gift while we were praying on Jackson Street on East Jackson in Muncie, Indiana, just shortly after he was spared from the edge of death because he was at the death at the time that Jesus spared him. The doctors didn't think so until they got that cardiogram on him and then they knew it. 
didn't want him to move anything because it was a, they could see from it that the blood clot was in the heart and you're not supposed to be alive. But he lived. First, you could feel the angels are ready to take him. You could feel them take him. Oh, it, was, it just seemed like it was going right into heaven. And we played, oh God, spare him to be a righteous man. Oh God, spare him, spare him to be a righteous man, Lord. Oh God, let, oh, let death go back, Jesus. Oh God, let death go back to heaven. Oh, let him be raised up to be a holy man. I had to pray like that for I don't know how long. Then I got easy. But God's grace, could we ever pray again through his spirit? He said, I hadn't been hearing you. And he said, at that wedding, after you got to preaching, I was supposed to jump up there and holler. You're not hearing what he's saying. Well, I said, my brother. He said, God told me, but I couldn't get the courage to do it. Couldn't get the strength. And so the Holy Spirit was working in the marriage. The wedding was priceless. God was helping. And Brother Morgan, Robert, in just a little while, you could tell the both of you that you were so in one in the Lord to Jesus' glory because of the Spirit that you had no adjustments to make. There were no adjustments. There were no adjustments to make with this handmaid of 47 then and this dear brother, that's just about two and a half months older than I am. It's a miracle. He's saying it now. They have no, they didn't have any adjustments to make. There was one person. There wasn't any adjustments. Do you know some people have been trying to make adjustments for 30, 40 years and still having little tussles? Yeah, many marriages are still trying to have tussles after 30 and 40 years. Jesus told me who his companion was and they were perfectly mated. By God's grace to Jesus' glory, through Christ, could it be from now on? God keeping us well mentally, spiritually, and physically. See, that gives God all the glory. See, he must have all the praise. Not only to the flesh, but all to God. We're talking about trusting. But he told me in about five or six days when I called, he says, Oh, I want to tell you, my brother, it's just wonderful how God's blessing Barbara and me. Oh, how I love her. She's so precious. And she came right in and she said, But Brother Helm, he is. Oh, Brother Helm, I love him. We're having such a wonderful time. That was so precious. He told me a year or two after that, he said, Brother Helm, they put all the women in the world. Don't me, it was how many millions? All the women right in front of me. He said, Barbara's my choice. <laughs> he said, I didn't know it. He said, I didn't know it. But he said, Jesus did. Now, he said, since Jesus revealed it, he said, I know it. Barbara, by God's grace, Jesus, she's my choice now. She's for me. They're so much alike. But I'm, I told you all this. You've heard this story. But I've been trying to get the life of trust into you a little deeper. Amen. But you take the more you know, the more things you know, uh-oh, we're in something now, aren't we? The more things you know and have read, the more you have to die to get this message. The more you know, the more things you have read, the more you have to die to get this message of trust. When you know something, then you have a situation in order to perceive the life of trust and to submit it into the library of your experience and take bare the hand of trust and the heart of faith. Now we're going to have to stop make announcements. I'd like to go on that is if Jesus were willing but that the, the, the food is on the table, or they're getting it on the table. We're supposed to be there in about eight or nine minutes. So we have a lot of organization to do. Our secretary's got, and you all, will you all cooperate well? Now I'll tell you how you'll cooperate. You cooperate very well if you're trusting. But if you're trustless, you'll complain a little and say, well, I'm, I'm not in this building, and I've got to go down here, and one thing or another, and I, it'll be difficult. So we got to be organized and know what to do now. 
how to eat. Uh, we'll be assembling here. Jesus, do you want us here at 12.30 or 1? 12.30 or 1. My head would say 1 by all means. He said 12.30 right there. That's all. Oh, Jesus, that means two hours. Be back here for this big, big, big assignment. See, my head would say, let's make it one. Give us a little time or help me to recover. He said, 1230. We don't go but what we think. The head. When you trust God, you do what the Holy Ghost says. <laughs> you pray for this weak, weak, weak man. I've been telling my children this for 30 years. Remember, the practice will be at about 10 to 12. Uh, be sure and leave the choir open for our Muskegon choir. How many members do you think you have here? 20? Fill the first uh, few seats up and then the other folk can come right in back out of maybe the youth choir or the adult choir from the other church. All right. Well, praise, are you going to, how, how are you going to cement this trust in? How are you going to cement this trust in here? How are you going to cement this trust in your life that only a small, small fragment or less, less than a fragment, has been talked about this morning? How are you going to perceive it, retain it, cement it? You have to dwell on it. You have to review this over and over and over. Yes, I've heard that story. I've heard this and I've heard this over. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, Jesus, help me to get this in my heart about the trusting so that I'll be able to be willing to start trusting more or altogether or some or entirely or wholeheartedly. Well, we'll just have to quit. Thank you for the flowers. Aren't they beautiful? All your work in here, all these beautiful things. And so thankful this uh, platform is high enough that I could see. You see, if I was only 10, 15 inches, I couldn't see you back there. And uh, it's hard to see all the folk for you to see us. And the main thing is to see Jesus. I trust you see Jesus. Feel Jesus. If, if by God's grace, it be by God's grace, if by God's grace you feel the love of Jesus Christ here, I'd like to hear you say amen. Amen! amen. Now that's important. It's to feel the love of Jesus. See, that's the most important of all, is to feel his love, the love of Almighty God for all of you, because you're all so precious indeed. Well, I'm not ready to sit down, but I have to. Yes. Praise the Lord. He'll sing the stanzas, and we'll all begin then with him on the chorus. The Lord help him, God willing. A worldwide revival is needed, a wondrous outpouring of power. The Holy Ghost promised from heaven, oh, how will this power now come? promote and we program revivals, crusades, and campaigns, but yet true revival still tarries. Oh, where is that promise of rain? Hush, wait upon
my friend, is the secret. God's plan now revealed to our age. The church must repent, become nothing. Then God shall revive her again. Wait upon God. Hush, wait upon God. Side B of this tape, we have included the third message on trust by Reverend Helm, delivered in the third session of the Waiting on God on 6 19 1977. Please turn the tape to the other side. Thank you. Praise the Lord. They that trust in the Lord 
shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. When the Holy Spirit called me to trust him for all things, 35, 36 years ago, this October, Jesus has miraculously, marvelously opened up marvelous ways of his kingdom to my heart. And as I have observed uh, this way of trusting, it has never grown old. It's always been fresh. It's been inspiring. And ever, ever commands us in inner death. Trust cannot exist in the self-assertive life. Self refuses to trust. But every heart that resists the devil and denies self and loses himself begins then a true trust in Jesus Christ. And to walk with him wholeheartedly and to trust him is a privilege indeed. It is an adventure indeed. It is spiritual growth. And it is getting our roots down into the rock so that God can work in your life wherever he wants to use you. Whether it's in a church or a home or in a place of business or in a school. So this privilege, this call of trusting is to each of you tonight. He's looking on you and your heart to see whether or not you will really trust him. When I go into the scriptures and I think of an example of trusting Jesus, I think of this beautiful story in St. Luke, writing the physician. And this man walked with God, and the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. And it said that this man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now, I want to bring to your attention the trust that this man had to possess and embrace in order to not get discouraged through all the years, the intervening time, for he had waited so many years for this promise. But he didn't get discouraged. He still believed and had faith to trust that someday he was going to see the Lord's Christ. He was going to see the Son of God. He had the revelation. The Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed to him by the Holy Ghost. So he trusted until the very moment and never, never gave up. He never gave up hope. He persevered to the end. Now, you remember he was an older man. He had waited for years. He had waited for a long time. He trusted and believed that one day God was going to reveal and allow him to see the Son of God, the Lord's Christ. But I want you, if I may, the Lord helping your heart to look into this and see this true trust that this Simeon had to embrace in order not to grow discouraged or to get disheartened, he embraced a trust in God that was not denied and was not forgotten. And as you observe the trust of Simeon, you see here that God had manifested himself and worked in his heart and worked in his life and you see his trust here did something beautiful. His trust in God did a marvelous thing, a wonderful thing, and that was he had him on time at the right place. His trust had him on time at the right place, at the right hour, the right moment. It was not denied. And if you trust the Lord, God will have you on time where you belong. If you'll trust him, he never failed. 
whether it's for soul winning or whether it's some need somewhere, he'll have you on time. He had Simeon on time at the right hour at the right place. Now, the wonder of it is that this man had such explicit trust that he could believe God's voice when he saw a little baby, only 40 days old. He had such trust. You know, so many people, you've got to prove things. You've got to prove it to them. You've got to give them some few evidences. You've got to give them some signs. They've got to see some wonders. But you just take a little baby in your arms and walk in like that. Of course, it's beautiful. Every child's beautiful. But he had to have a lot of trust because they were looking for Jesus to come as a monarch, as a great ruler, as a mighty man of valor. And here was his servant with the Holy Ghost upon him. And when Mary came in with a baby in her arms, God spoke and said, Simeon, here he is. <laughs> Look at this trust. Look at the trust in this man. Look at this faith and trust and belief and no doubt whatsoever. No hesitancy. He had such trust for all these years that just as soon, I want to tell you, trust opens our eyes. Trust opens our eyes. Trust gives us vision. Trust gives us insights. Why, think of the insight that Simeon had to have when he saw a baby 40 days old. Look at the walk of this man. It it required a trust in his life that was steadfast and movable, you see. And he was so stayed in God's will and God's faith and trust that when these precious ones came in with this little babe, 40 days old, he said, here he is. He just went over. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, the trust that this matter. He took him up in his arms. Oh, it takes courage. You take an old man. They've not held babies for a good while. You know, there has been a time in my life for the last two or three years, I didn't hardly want to take a child because it didn't feel very well at times. And I, I wanted to be sure, you know, to have a hold of them just right. And when you're not used to taking children in your arms, you've got to be sure what you're doing because you have a bundle of preciousness there. Very, very precious and in the soul. Uh, we've got to be careful. And he went right over. Now, you see, he never saw Joseph and Mary before. But he went over and took Jesus up in his arms and blessed God. He rejoiced. The faith and the trust of this man is most remarkable. Oh, it was not, it was not blind. It was seeing. Now, in trust, there is recognition. There in trust, there's recognition. Now, you, you take a trustless heart, and he, uh, some people wonder why there aren't abilities in recognition. Uh, spiritual recognition comes through a life of consistent trust. Spiritual recognition comes through a life of trust, recognizing certain needs, certain weaknesses, Certain situations, pitfalls, revelations, wonderful things, things not so good. But trust, as we trust God, he gives unto you the very best they can share with you. In fact, if a heart will trust God truly and be all together, God will trust that one with more than I could tell you. And what I tell you this, you know what he's telling me by the Holy Ghost from heaven? He says, I'm guiding you and directing you and telling you what to do. That's what he told me. I didn't know he was going to do that, Brother Schultz. said, just then. Yes, just then. He said to the soul that will trust him throughout, and absolutely trust him in every instance, in all things, he will trust with that soul most marvelous things that's beyond what I can tell you if you will trust him completely and entirely, without wavering, without question, without doubt, without murmurings, without disputings. Amen. Of course, in the life of trust, there aren't any disputings. In the life of true trust, there isn't any criticism. There isn't any hateful spirit. There isn't any harsh spirit. In the true life of trust, there's refining. 
You see, the power and the fire comes through the true life of trust and begins to refine out of you all the briars and all the harshness and all the criticisms and all these awful things because they don't go with the life of trust. In the life of trust and victory and joy and light and heaven and revelation, praise the Lord, it's in a wonderful area. When this man took him up in his arms. Oh, he could, he could trust the King of Glory. He could trust the Ancient of Days. Praise God! It was with the Father in the beginning of time. He had that one who was with the Father in the beginning of time in his arms. He had that one that helped to put the stars in their orbits. He held in his arm. He's trustworthy, trustworthy, with this beautiful, beautiful. Precious gift of God to the world. Oh, my friends, he was holding in his arms the King, the Son of God, that precious one, altogether lovely. Just imagine all that rested in his arms. Just about everything rested in his arms. Did you know that about everything, from calendar to circumstance, rested in his arms? He took him up. He knew him. You see, trust knows. Trust knows. And God reveals to trust what's to be taken in the arms of service, of care, to follow on. And he holds him in his arms. This man that God could trust with his son in declaration and revelation. He saw the, you know, while Jesus was in his arms, he saw the cross. Yeah, he saw the cross. I'll tell you, the Lord will reveal a lot of things to you if you'll trust him, if you really will trust. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if you trust him consistently and continuously. He'll reveal marvelous things to you, maybe things that uh, you can't share with anyone because he can trust you to give him all the glory and all the praise and all the honor and all thanksgiving unto God. He'll reveal to you all that he possibly could share with you for the good of your life and those near you or the nation with you or the place you live. If you'll trust him with all there is within you, it is urgent that we come to the place of wholehearted trust. And Simeon is an example of wholehearted trust. And he revealed himself to this precious man. And this man knew the king was coming. The great one. The mighty one. In fact, I'll tell you, if we missed Jesus, we missed it all. We missed everything. Because you see, Jesus Christ is the gift of God. He's his son and the only way to God. There isn't any way to find him. Only through Jesus. That's the only way we can get to him. He's access. He's our intercessor forever after the order of Melchizedek. And he's the one that leads us home. He's the one that takes us onward. And Simeon held him in his arms and knew that this was the Lord Christ. Oh, oh it's, it, it just fails me in words to tell about this wonderful revelation, this wonderful pilgrim that God could trust with his son and trust for the revelation that he would not depart, he would not go to heaven until he had seen his son. The trust that's in this man. Well, I think of another scripture that comes to my mind concerning to illustrate trust. And perhaps you've thought about it many times. But I, I think of, of a wonderful story over in Matthew, chapter 2, and it tells that there are wise men, three of them, and they had the revelation that God's Son was being born. These men had to have a real trust in God. They had to have a trust in truth and revelation. And these wise men saw, and they had studied, they had searched, and they saw that the Christ, the Son of God, was born. The King was born. 
Now, they had to have a lot of courage and strength in trust to travel from afar. They'd come a, they came a long way. And they had to persevere in order to come to see the birthplace of the King of Glory, the Son of God. And they didn't give up. They just persevered right on. They must have had a tremendous trust in God, in Christ. Oh, the trust they possessed. The courage, it took a lot of courage to persevere on and on and on. And they said, well, you know, the devil could have said in the flesh, well, you're just dreamers. <laughs> oh, you fellas, you've come all this way. You've just wasted your time. and You've just messed up with your energies. You've got to misappropriate it. The devil and all kinds of things could have been talking to them. But they didn't listen to it. The trusting heart has a single ear to God. The trusting heart listens to God, not to the earth. The trusting heart, see, they had to be listening to God or they would have given up. See, the trusting heart listens to God, listens to Christ, lets the Holy Spirit speak into the inner life. The trusting heart listens to the revelation of God. Praise his wonderful name. That he can reveal to the trusting heart all that he sees fit to share. Because the trusting heart is going to give him all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. And the trusting heart is going to follow the star. Amen. The trusting heart is going to follow the star and not give up. You say, well, you know, if you're going to follow a star, it's got to be a cloudless night. You can't follow a star with the sky full of clouds unless you travel by radar. And these men knew and believed, and they didn't give up. They went all the way. They went all the way to see Jesus. Say, I want to tell you something else about these wise men. They had trusted so much that they loved God to the extent they had gifts with them. They already had everything ready. Oh yeah, they trusted God so much, their gifts were already. They didn't go empty-handed. The trusting heart is never empty-handed. The trusting heart is never in despair. He always has a little package there. The trusting heart always has a little package there to share, to give. Because it's more blessed to give than to receive. Yes, God works that way. He does marvelously leading his children, guiding his people, taking care of those that follow him. The trusting heart always has a little surprise. There's always a little surprise with the trusting heart. It turns out beautiful. It's marvelous. And the wonder part about this story is it can't be told. It can't be relayed. It cannot be conveyed. Everyone that trusts the Lord, what he's doing for you, you cannot tell it in words what he's bringing to pass. You'll try to get the words, and you may be very able in abilities with words and vocabularies of men. But at the very best, the very best, we can't convey. The trusting heart can't tell all these wonderful things that God works within them. It, it, it passes the point of expression, of declaration. It goes beyond that. The trusting heart. Because God is so wonderful to the trusting spirit. Jesus, we pray that you will heal bodies now. To heal the back, heal the body. Lord, take out, we pray that the pain and suffering, dear Lord, this anguish, this pain, oh God, we pray that you'll get into the muscles and the bones and the tendons, the tissues and all the fibers, Lord, and rebuke this. We bind you, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ, and we bind you and all these hurts and all these things that are trying to hurt the body. We bind you and take you out to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and let them rest. The trusty heart looks onward and believes and presses on in obedience, never looking back. So God is always 
always aiding and helping the trusting heart. It's not, it's not the time of the trusting heart. Many times we have certain things we want to see come to pass. But with the trusting heart, uh, he, he doesn't have preconceived ideas and get it all lined out. The trusting heart simply gives it all to God, all to Jesus, and allows the Lord all full reign to take care of every plan and every one of his purposes and all that he has in store. To trust the Lord with all the heart. Well, he's going to be like Mount Zion. And he's going to abide. God's going to give that heart to trust him, the strength to stand in the storm, stand in the difficult time. So he wills that we trust him and continually relying upon him and knowing that in due season we're going to see the Lord Christ. We're going to see him. You know, he's coming again. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. We were in a little church not far away from here. Just a few hundred miles in the last few months. And the Lord Jesus, on the way to the church, began to reveal to us the music that Mrs. Helm should play. So she wrote the numbers down, and then she uh, looked at the titles. So the, the numbers were revealed by the help of the Lord through the Holy Spirit's guidance and the witness of the Holy Spirit. And then we got to the church, and the Lord began to work with us about the meeting. And it revealed to us what, what Brother John was to sing. And it revealed to us what Son John was to sing. The number. I didn't know what they were. And then he told me you were to sing a certain number. And James was praying. And then the Lord revealed to me that the time is short. You're going to preach on the time is short. And I felt so utterly needy because all my notes, of course, was in the other Bible and it wasn't there. James thought it was in the motel. It turned out to be in the van. But the Lord just wanted me to trust him for that. And we began to preach on the time is short that night. Oh, how the Lord moved upon our heart that the time is near when Jesus is coming back here. He's getting back to work. We don't know when it is, but it's soon. My wife said, going to the motel that night, she said, you know, there were two numbers that God revealed before the service. And they were there on the list, but the, I didn't get to play them. And I said, what was the numbers? And she said, the first one was, it may be soon, and the king is coming. Those are the last two numbers on the list. She didn't get to play those. And here God had revealed those at 6.30, before 6 to 6.30, and he didn't tell me to 7.25 7.20, that I was preaching on the time is short. And uh, the pastor, of course, we had never worked with him, and uh, she had played a number of numbers, and then he came and had prayer. So those were the two numbers. So let's trust Jesus. Let's trust God. Amen. Because the coming of the Lord is at hand. Let's trust him for the work of the Holy Spirit. Let's trust him as we wait upon him that he can refine us. That we can be true vessels, sanctified meat for Jesus. Because he is coming. The Lord is looking upon your heart and mine. To see whether or not we truly, wholeheartedly, will be exactly in faith and trust as he wills. And he desires for you and me to be. And not require, but believe. Praise the Lord. Now, Jesus, we have thought about trusting thee. And we were thinking today about how you were so marvelous to us when the home was being built. And those times when we had to trust for everything. And when it wasn't easy... We didn't have much, too much encouragement from the city. We had a few prayer warriors that prayed and helped us. We were thankful for them. They were so encouraging. And then we've had, we trusted for Son Jack's salvation for 21 to 22 years. And you saved him and made him to become a new creature. He was so happy and, and so precious and helpful. 
We trusted for 26 years for Robert Allen's salvation. And you saved him and changed his life. Oh, how wonderful it is to trust you for loved ones to be saved and for neighbors to be saved. And we know, dear Lord, as we trust, you will always take care of it. I'll never come too late. We were so thankful, Jesus, for all the others that have been trusting for their neighbors and their loved ones, their sons and daughters, to find Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. We've been trusting for the work of the Holy Spirit in the church, in the ministry, in the laity, that all of us in the churches will will no longer proceed on our preconceived ideas. They will not proceed on what we want, this or that. But we will do God's will on trust so that he can work everything out the way you plan and you see best. We thank the Lord as we were trusting. We were thinking about when we were trusting for the little church to be built at Muskegon. I was thinking how... We were trusting Brother Roundtree and James and how they led and directed about the buildings over there and how you worked that out and it took time and how you had other things to occur so that you could bring your will to pass. And we want to thank thee for the way thee is working and how you have moved in this area and how you have helped as the Alexanders, Brother and Sister Alexander, thy servants in Memphis and how you've worked there and you've led there and directed there. Are you blessed as they've trusted thee to open the door for the place where you wanted them? Oh, it's so precious just to trust thee and to wait upon thee, O oh Lord. And we thank thee, O oh God, for the Holy Spirit that strengthens us in the life of trust, the word of God that feeds and enlightens. We ask now, Father, in Jesus' name, for the work of the Holy Spirit. In Christ's name, we beseech thee for thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing now, the Lord willing. Is there any number on your hearts? Do you have any number chosen? Then we will stand and sing 182. If you please, let us stand. 152. 152 in the red book. Let's be obedient to Jesus and be faithful to God, giving him our heart, our life, and saying, Lord, I'm going to cease trusting myself. I'm not going to trust in circumstances. I'm going to trust in the leadership of the Holy Ghost. We're here to endeavor to learn to trust and to wait upon God. Just Yes. 